Hello everyone, my name is Karen Talia. Um, I'm your host and moderator today. Welcome to ISGIP Live Journal Club for August. Um, I'm broadcasting live from Melbourne, Australia. And our topic for this month is vulvar pathology. And I'm really excited um, to say that we have three pathology trainees who are presenting for us today. And we also have Natalie Benet on for this session. So we welcome her too. Um, now, while people are still joining, I've got some general information regarding Journal Club um, and some notices regarding upcoming events that I'll just go through. Um, I'm sure you all know this by now, but um, I'm hosting ISGIP Live Journal Club every alternate month with Natalie Bernay uh, in the United States. So this means that every other month, Journal Club will occur at a time that suits so those of us who live in the Eastern hemisphere of the world. And the goal with this is to try and engage a larger global audience. If you can't be online at the time of the session and you register for Journal Club via the ISGIP educational website, you will be sent a video link to watch the meeting afterwards. And our aim with Journal Club is to create a forum where trainee pathologists and early career pathologists can present and discuss papers in a supported environment. And we'll provide you with the journal article and we'll mentor you in the lead up to the session, um, including running a practice session presenting to help you prepare for the day. Um, ISTIP also has another new initiative, which is launching for trainees. And this is an interesting case presentation series, which is moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett. And this will run to a similar format as Journal Club with three presentations per session and mentorship offered in the lead up to the day. So if you think you'd like to participate in either Journal Club or the Interesting Case Presentation Series, please uh, contact Dr. Benet, Dr. Bennett or myself via the email addresses listed here. And remember, you don't need to be an ISGIP member to participate. And also remember that ISGIP membership is free to all trainees. And you can find out more about all of this by visiting the ISGIP uh, website where other um, educational events are also listed. And on that note, we've got three upcoming events that I'd like to let you know about. Um, we have an ISGIP Live podcast, uh, Joe, Raber, Joe Rabin presenting a podcast on the ISGIP Endocervical Adenocarcinoma Project Part 1, which is about the macroscopic handling and intraoperative consultation with endocervical adenocarcinoma. Uh, we've got the first interesting case presentation series moderated by Dr. Bennett on the same day, both are on August the 25th. And then we have Professor Marissa Nucci presenting a webinar on mesenchymal lesions of the lower female genital tract on the 2nd of September. So the learning objectives for today and for Journal Club going forward are listed here. And as you can see, our main aim is to try and engage junior pathologists and trainee pathologists um, and to provide mentorship. And this is uh, a template for the presentation that we provide in the form of a PowerPoint template. So this is um, to help guide you in putting together your presentation and also in critically evaluating the literature and hopefully writing um, papers yourselves. So today's schedule, uh, we have our three speakers, two are from Australia, we've got Roger Kim from Sydney in New South Wales and Amitha Thomas from Melbourne, and also Dr. Roy Fontillas from Manila in the Philippines. And once uh, each of our presenters has spoken, we'll have a collective um, discussion, take some questions and wrap up. Um, if you would like to post questions during the session, uh, the Q&A function um, is either down the bottom or up the top of your screen, and you can also um, upvote questions that you would like to hear the answers to. Uh, this month's theme uh, is vulvar pathology. And our first speaker, Roger Kim uh, from New South Wales, is presenting high-grade neuroendocrine carcinomas of the vulva, a clinico-pathologic study of 16 cases. And this is a paper recently published in AJSP. Amitha Thomas will be presenting targeted molecular sequencing of recurrent and multifocal non-HPV associated squamous cell carcinomas of the vulva from the International Journal of Gynae Pathology. And Roy will be presenting expanding the morphologic immunohistochemical and 
I've just lost the words, genotypic features of high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions of the vulva with morphology mimicking differentiated vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia and or lichen sclerosis from International Journal of Gynecological Pathology. So I'll now go ahead and um, introduce our three speakers and then I'll hand over to Roger to get started. So Roger Kim, our first speaker is uh, a fifth year pathology registrar at Douglas Hanley Moyer Pathology in Sydney in Australia. Um, he's already got a track record of participating um, and contributing to scientific meetings. He's recently won the first prize in um, the ASC case presentation competition. He was slated to be a speaker at the IAP in Sydney in 2020, and unfortunately that was cancelled due to COVID. And he has won a Best Poster Award in Anatomical Pathology at the Pathology Update in 2019. Amitha Thomas is a second year pathology registrar at Box Hill Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. And Dr. Roy Fontillis is a fourth year pathology resident uh, at the University of San Tomas Hospital in Manila, Philippines. So I'll now turn the podium over to Roger to get started. I will stop sharing my screen and if everyone else can mute themselves and also stop sharing. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Roger, I'm the registrar at Douglas Henry Moyer Pathology. Today I'll be discussing about a paper on a high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma of the vulva, published in the American Journal of Surgical Pathology. So the vulvar high-grade neuroendocrine carcinoma can be further subclassified into a Merkel cell carcinoma, small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And what the authors of the paper felt that a lot of the publication regard the vulvar high-grade neuroendocrine tumor as Merkel cell carcinoma, and they did not attempt to make a distinction between Merkel cell carcinoma and small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. So they reviewed 16 cases of their vulvar neuroendocrine carcinoma to identify clinical, histopathological, and immunophenotype of these tumors. So the paper started off with this clear definition of each of these entities, so for the small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, it must show a small cell morphology where cells are very monotonous with a nu nuclear molding and very scant cytoplasm and then a lot of necrosis and apoptosis. And Merkel cell carcinoma shares a very similar morphological features, but it also must be supported by the uh, typical immuno immunophenotype with CK20 and CAP5.2 and neurofilament showing a dot or a ring-like positivity. And these tumors are also positive for Merkel cell polymer virus T cell antigen, which I'll get into in later on. And there's also a large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, which shows a cells with abundant cytoplasm with prominent nucleoli, which shows a organoid and trabecular architecture with some with peripheral palisading. And it could also have necrosis and brief mitosis and apoptosis. And there also, also I uh, want to identify if, if any of these tumors are involving the Bartholian gland, and they use the Bartholian gland carcinoma criteria to make sure the tumors didn't originate from the vulvar surface or represent a metast metastasis from an extra vulvar site. And they also included mixed neuroendocrine and non neuroendocrine carcinoma, MINAC. And this was previously called, this was previously called MANIC, mixed adeno and neuroendocrine carcinoma but it is newly defined as MINAC in 2017 WHO endocrine organs. And it must show two different neoplastic components with including one being neuroendocrine. So they performed a retrospective review up to 37 years of their database and initially identified 18 cases of vulvar high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. And among them, they excluded two of them because because one of them turned out to be a vulvar mammary-like adenocarcinoma with neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine staining, and other one turned out to be a metastasis from a cervical primary. So among the remaining 16 cases, they performed a clinical and slide review to identify these characteristics. And for the ancillary studies, they used CK20 and CAM 5.2 to prove the epithelial differentiation and neuroendocrine markers for neuroendocrine differentiation 
And for the miracle cell carcinoma, they did neurofilaments and polymervirus T cell antigen. And in addition to this, they did CD117, TTF1, SAPE2, and HPV RNA ish. So I just wanted to add some background information of some of these ancillary studies. So in regards to polymervirus T cell antigen, Merkel cell polymervirus are casually linked up to 80% of Merkel cell carcinoma. So there is this antibody which can, which can detect this antigen expression in this Merkel cell carcinoma, and it must show nuclear staining for it to be a positive. And SAP2, you might recall, is a stain that is often used for colorectal and osteosarcoma, osteosarcomas. And it, there is another study found up, approximately 80% of Merkel cell carcinoma also stains for this, for this stain. And it is useful to distinguish the Merkel cell carcinoma from other neuroendocrine carcinomas. They also did a HPV RNA-ish, which can detect a transcription of uh, oncoprotein E6 and E7. And it is considered a gold standard to identify high-risk HPV because it proves the transcriptional active infection. And it can also be used in formally fixed paraffin embedded tissue. And P16, as we know, is a surrogate for this surrogate for this um, oncoproteins as they induce overexpression of P16. But not all P16 positive cases are have, have a high risk HPV. So this is this issue is considered a high a gold standard to identify this infection. So in the in terms of clinical features, they found the patients with age range from 39 to 90 years of age with median of 54 years, 54 years. And they most commonly presented with palpable mass in the vulva and pain in that area. And symptoms of diagnosis ranges from one to 34 months. And the common, most common location were on labia majors and the size ranges from 0 0.7 to six centimeters. And management wise, most all patients received surgical treatment, some with inguinal lymph adenopathy, and some also received adjuvant chemo and radiotherapy. And some had recurrence and side of metastasis later on, which showed metastasis to inguinal lymph node and some to lung and liver. And prognosis overall was up in average about 24 months and for five years survival rate was 12%. In terms of histopathological features, among these 16 cases, 15 of them showed a pure neuroendocrine morphology. And among them, 13 showed pure uh, small, small cell morphology. And among those 13 cases, six were Merkel cell carcinoma and seven were small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma after excluding the Merkel cell carcinoma from these ancillary studies. And among those seven cases, one case showed mixed small cell and large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And one case was pure large cell neuroendocrine carcinoma. And then there was one case which they couldn't further subclassify because there, was, there weren't any tissue to perform a ancillary studies. For that, they did they proved epithelial and neuroendocrine endocrine differentiation based on electron microscopy. And there was also a one case of MINAC, which showed large cell neuroendocrine and moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma. So in terms of IHC features, for the, Mer for the Merkel, cell, Merkel cell carcinoma, it shows a ring, ring or dot-like positivity, as we see here. And for the neurofilaments, it showed partial, some of the cells staining for that classical patterns. And most cases stained for the polymer virus T cell antigen, as we see here. No, none of the studies stained for TTF1. And it also stained for CD117 and SATB2, but all of them were negative for HPV RNA ish. For the vulvular small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, it did not show those classical Merkel cell carcinoma staining for the CAMP 5.2, CK20, and neurofilaments, and none stained for polymer virus T cell antigen. And some of them did stain for TTF1 and more stronger staining for CD117. And SATB2 was also positive, but compared to Merkel cell carcinoma, it was a bit patchy and was not as strongly positive. And all of the cases stained for HPV RNA ish. So for the tumors that involving, put, involving the Bartholian gland, so one of the cases, they could not de determine the origin because tumor replaced most of the uh, most of the remaining uh, ocelian glands, so they couldn't determine the origin. One case, they were happy to call it small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma arising from the ocelian gland because they could see the tumors adjacent to these benign, these benign glands. 
And uh, another case of MINAC also involved the Bosnian gland region. But this one, it was also, they couldn't determine the origin because there's tumor also on the surface. They, so they couldn't determine whether the tumor originated from the surface or originated from the Bartholian gland. So from this most significant finding from this study is that they found approximately half of the small cell neuroendocrine tumor show, turned out to be a Merkel cell carcinoma, and the other half turned out to be a small cell neuroendocrine tumor. So they found this is a great contrast to a published study which considered most uh, high-grade neuroendocrine tumor of the vulva as Merkel cell carcinoma. And those studies did not perform the IC to, to support the Merkel cell carcinoma lineage. And among those few studies which did report small cell neuroendocrine carcinomas, they did not exclude Merkel cell carcinoma as differentials. So in terms of inner profile, the author felt these six and three studies were most helpful in distinguishing between Merkel cell carcinoma and the non-Merkel cell probable high-grade neuroendocrine tumors. So as we discuss, discussed before, so CK20 and CAP5.2 and neurofilaments show a classical staining pattern for Merkel cell carcinomas, whereas these are not seen in non-Merkel cell carcinomas. SAPI2 can be positive for both of, both of them, but more diffuse nuclear staining is seen in Merkel cell carcinoma. And polyomavirus is only positive for Merkel cell carcinoma, whereas negative for the non-Merkel cell vulvular high grade neuroendocrine tumors. And RNA-ish was only positive for the non-Merkel cell vulvular neuroendocrine tumors. Although P16 was not, was not performed as part of their ancillary studies, but they also do make note that P16 is also positive for Merkel cell carcinoma and hence cannot be used to distinguish between these two entities. So in terms of a high-grade neuroendocrine tumors arising from the Bartholian gland, they found some, the case had a very lobular architecture with some with a mosaic-like mosaic architecture, which was not seen in Merkel cell carcinoma. And they also raised the possibility of maybe perhaps this subset of high-grade neuroendocrine tumor might have derived from a Bartholian gland because when they performed a, a neuroendocrine stains, it stained both the tumor and also the normal benign glands. And whereas these normal glands were negative for the HPV RNA-ish, hence it excludes the pagetoid involvement by the tumor. So in terms of vulvular MINAC, this is to also believe this is the first case of combination of large cell neuroendocrine tumor with moderate differentiated carcinoma. And there were only two previously published cases of vulvular MINAC, which both of them showed Merkel cell carcinoma with SEC. So they found this was quite unique. And the strength of this paper is that it involved the largest number of cases of vulvar high-grade neuroendocrine tumor, and as it is a very rare entity. And it started off with very clear definition of each entity at the beginning, and they support each definition with ISC findings, and they performed a very thorough morphology and immunoprofile comparison. The areas of improvement for this paper, I felt, was despite that, it's still a very limited number of cases. And, in, and the paper did not dis, uh, talk about a clinical implication or importance of making this distinction, but they do make note of the Merkel cell carcinoma research group recently identified a checkpoint inhibitor, inhibitor which may be effective in treating the metast metastatic NCMC, and they feel they, it might have a therapeutic implication in the vulva as well. And in terms of polymervirus antigen and high-risk HPV RNA -ish availability, I was not certain whether most labs have access to these ancillary studies to perform to help to make distinction between Merkel cell carcinoma and a non Merkel cell neuroendocrine tumor of the vulva. So, how do we apply this pa uh, paper in our practice? So, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that high grade neuroendocrine tumor of the vulva can be further subclassified, and ancillary tests that can help to help with this uh, um, subclassification include CK20 and CAMP 5.2 and neurofilament, and if available, can also add polymervirus antigen and HPV RNA-ish. And it is also important not to overlook the neuroendocrine component in the, in the vulva. So in terms of MINAC, it is, uh, as it showed a solid, it is important not to mistake a solid component as polydifferentiated adenocarcinoma or SC with basaloid features. And for the large cell neuroendocrine tumor is a potential pitfall because it lacks the classical neuroendocrine phenotype such as salt and pepper chromatin, and it may be mistaken as other tumors. So for that, it is important to note 
a a neural endocrine growth, growth pattern such as peripheral palisading and lobulated architecture and geographic necrosis, which can help but not overlook the neuroendocrine component in that case. And for the small cell neuroendocrine tumor arising on the basilian gland, it's, it's, as shown before, it can show a rosette-like or glandular structures, and it is important not to mistake this as adenocarcinoma. And these are the external references that I used for the background information for these ancillary studies, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Roger. That was fantastic. Really appreciate that. Uh, just sharing my screen again. Okay. All right. That was wonderful. Thank you, Roger. Um, we're now moving on to Amitha Thomas for our second presentation. Um, Amitha, if you'd like to unmute yourself and start sharing your screen, that would be fantastic. Um, so it says I cannot start sharing screen while other participant is. Oh, let me just try again. Just stop sharing. Okay. Thanks. Hopefully this works. <sighs> great. Okay, that's great. So um, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Tali and Dr. Bane, for organizing this and giving me an opportunity to present today. So my article is on the targeted molecular sequence of recurrent and multifocal non-HPV-associated squamous cell carcinoma of the vulva. So vulva SCC accounts for 5% of all gynae malignancies. And although the survival for other gynae tumors have improved over the past few decades, this unfortunately has not been the case for vulva SCC. And approximately 30% of patients experience tumor recurrence. So vulva SEC can be divided based on its association, association with HPV. We have our HPV-associated SCC, which typically has UVIN as a precursor lesion. And then we have the non-HPV-associated SCC, which is what this paper focuses on. And this can be further subdivided based on its presence or absence of the TP53 mutation. So those with the TP53 mutation are typically associated with the differentiated vulva intraepithelial neoplasia, or DVIN. And these typically progress to form a keratinizing SCC. And the TP53 wild type lesions are typically associated with the differentiated exophytic vulva intraepithelial lesion or devil or vulvar acanthosis with alter differentiation or VAD. And these typically progress to form a verrucous carcinoma. So it's been unclear whether these recurrences are the same primary tumor or the development of a new tumor. So to better understand the molecular basis of these tumors, the authors have examined the mutational profile of a series of patients with recurrent or multifocal non-HPV-associated vulva SCC. So with the materials and methods, the case selection was built from a series of 61 vulva cases with a known mutational profile with both the primary tumor. The recurrences and multifocal tumors related to the primary tumor was acquired for the study. Specimens were reviewed and reclassified as conventional SEC, verrucous carcinoma, DVIN, VAD, and DEVIL. All the cases were negative for P16, and AP53 was done on all the cases and scored based on its pattern of staining. All cases with positive margins for invasive carcinoma were excluded, and preference was given to cases that had recurrences occurring over a long period of time. Additional features that were clinical that were included were the age, the stage of primary diagnosis, initial treatment, time between recurrence, the survival since the first diagnosis, and the patient's current health status. With regards to the next generation sequencing, areas of interest were called from formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue blocks. And to ensure that the area of interest was acquired, post core HE slides were reviewed. And cases were analyzed using a next generation sequencing platform. And this panel examined 120 hotspots, 17 exons, and 33 cancer genes. So the results showed that there were nine patients identified with recurrent vulva SECs, and there were five patients with multifocal vulva SEC. The mean age at primary diagnosis was 69 years, and 13 out of the 14 patients presented with stage one disease. All of the primary tumors were conventional SECs, and there were three cases that had indeterminate margins in which two had tumor fragmentation, and there were five patients that had positive margins for precursor lesions. 
All eight patients with recurrent invasive SCC developed their first recurrence after a mean time of 36 months. And all patients with recurrent tumors had in situ lesions. Eight of them had DVIN and one patient had a double lesion. This particular patient didn't have recurrence of her invasive carcinoma, but she had recurrent double lesions. And interestingly, she had the longest survival of 17 years. The overall survival was 50% with seven patients dying. Four of those patients died with complications of the vulvar carcinoma, and three patients died of unknown causes. So 79 mutations were identified in six genes. Of those, TP53 had 65% of the mutations. This was followed by PIK3CA with 20% of mutations. P10 had 5%, HRAS had 8%, EGFR and GNAS each had 1% of mutations. And the commonest type of mutation was a missense mutation. So this table shows the molecular aberrations in the group with the recurrent vulva SEC. Five out of our nine patients had the same mutation in the primary and recurrent SEC, as well as their DBIN. Of those five, two gained new mutations on new genes. These two also had DBIN at the margins. Three patients showed no evidence of shared mutation in the primary and recurrent tumors. Despite having TP53 gene mutations in all of these patients, they didn't have the same nucleotide changes, so the mutations were actually different. The most common mutation was in TP53, and eight out of our nine patients harbored mutations in this gene. Only one patient with a conventional SCC didn't have a TP53 mutation, and in actual fact, this patient didn't harbor any mutations with this SCC, and this was associated with devil rather than DBIN. Regarding the non-TP53 mutations, there were two patients with PIK3CA mutations, two patients with um, HRAS mutations, and one patient with a P10 mutation on recurrence. Case four was an interesting patient. She had two types of um, tumors in her primary. She had a high-grade and low-grade area, both having a, P, a PIK3CA and P53 mutation. On her first re recurrence, she developed a conventional SCC, and this tumor harbored an additional P10 mutation. And on second recurrence, she had a verrucous carcinoma. And in addition to the primary mutations, this patient also had a new HRAS mutation. There was one recurrent case of devil with the same PIK3CA mutation in all except one of the recurrences. This next table shows the cases of multifocal vulva SCC and their mutational profile. Here we have five patients, and four of those five patients had mutations in their multifocal tumor. One patient had the same mutation in both of the tumor nodules. There were three patients with TP53 mutations present, and only the one patient with a mutation that didn't have a TP53 mutation instead both of these tumor nodules had P10 and HRAS mutations, one of the nodules harboring an additional GNAS mutation. In general, the P53 staining patterns correlated to the TP53 mutational status. There were seven absent or null patterns of staining and 26 parabasal or diffuse patterns of staining, and these corresponded appropriately to TP53 mutations. The exceptions were this one case that had a splice site mutation in TP53 that had wild type staining. And this case of case four with the verrucous carcinoma, she had a TP53 mutation, but her P53 IHC showed wild type staining. I just wanna highlight, it's mentioned here that it's basal overexpression, but the text and subsequent imaging actually shows wild type staining. So I believe that that's actually a typo. So this study found that 56% of recurrent and 80% of multifocal tumors demonstrated a clonal relationship in that the, they had the same mutational profile as the primary tumor. 22% recurred with additional mutations and 33% of the recurrent tumors showed completely new mutations. TP53 was the most frequently identified mutation and there was a single case with devil that had a PIK3CA mutation rather than a TP53 mutation. This represents patient four, and she had a change in histotype and molecular status. This was her initial tumor that showed the low-grade area of SCC and the high-grade area. Both these had a PIK3CA and P TP53 mutation. On her first recurrence, she had a conventional SCC and DBIN. 
And on histologic review, VAD was found to be at the edge of this tumor. And additionally, she developed a P10 mutation with this tumor. On her second recurrence, she developed a verrucous carcinoma. And in addition to the original mutations, she developed an HRAS mutation. So this unusual case shows that VAD and DVIN and SCC and verrucous carcinoma are not mutually exclusive. And it also emphasizes that lesions with shared mutations can manifest as different morphologies. And unusually, when she had the recurrence of the verrucous carcinoma, her P53 showed a wild type staining pattern despite having a P50, TP53 mutation. And the authors have hypothesized that perhaps the sections cut out for IHC may not have contained the mutation. And had they cut deeper, they may have had better sections for staining. So the next couple of slides examine the possible causes of the paper's findings. The main finding was that the recurrent tumor had the same mutation as the primary. And this raises the possibility that the tumor may have not been completely excised. The explanation for this may be due to the under-recognition of DVIN. So the majority of the discordant diagnosis on histologic review involved DVIN, and this was partly due to a change in terminology over the years, but also due to the diagnostic difficulty in recognizing DVIN. And the authors have suggested some useful features present in DVIN. The one is um, the presence of basal atypia, which is considered to be the only actual essential required feature. Another useful feature is the interface between normal tissue and DVIN in an optimal specimen and P53 as an ancillary tool. Another explanation proposed is the presence of TP53 lesions. So these lesions can't be detected by histologic examination alone, and lichen sclerosis, as an example, can harbor TP53 mutations, and early TP53 clones can develop on a molecular level without histologic changes. So this raises the question whether surgical resection, which is the mainstay of treatment, is actually enough for if we're leaving neoplastic clones behind. Another finding was that a subset of the recurrent tumors had the same, had additional mutations when compared to the primary tumor. And a less likely explanation may be that the primary tumor was actually molecularly heterogeneous, but not completely sequenced. But the preferred rationale is that the TP53 is considered to be the guardian of the genome and mutations in it result in genomic fragility and likelihood for subsequent additional mutations to occur become a lot higher. Three out of our nine patients in our recurrent tumor group um, had completely new mutations, and these mutations are thought to represent a new, mut a new tumor rather than a true recurrence. So given that non-HPV-associated vulva SCC occurs in the setting of a chronic inflammatory state, it's thought that like inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancers, this creates a permissive environment for the development of carcinoma. So the strengths of this paper, I thought, included the precision that they had in obtaining material for next generation sequencing. They, they appropriately excluded SEC at the margin. And they had really long periods of follow-up. The standard time of follow-up was six years, but we saw with that case of the recurrent devil, it went up to 17 years. So they also appropriately re-reviewed and reclassified cases to adjust for a change in terminology, but it also served to illustrate how cases of DVIN were missed initially. Some of the weaknesses included that it was a really small series with a limited NGS panel. Two of the cases in the recurrent and multifocal group didn't have any mutations, and this was likely because the driver mutations weren't really included in the original NGS panel. They also included cases with DVIN at the margin, which is a known precursor lesion, and they didn't really make any mention of other TP53 signature lesions. Also, there were some inconsistencies within the results section. They kind of lumped DEVIL with DVIN, um, and also despite saying that they've excluded SEC at the margin, there was the one patient which had a fragmented tumor at indeterminate margins that they actually included in, in the case study. And there were a couple of typos present as well. With the applications, as we've seen from the study, most of the recurrences show a clonal relation to the primary tumor. So it's important to be able to accurately diagnose precursor lesion given its pre-malignant um, potential. So it may be prudent to have a, a low threshold for suspecting DVIN in affected populations. With regards to adequacy of resection, 
most of the patients in the study had multiple recurrences and 30%, so four of the patients, four of the 14 died of vulva SEC, despite having what was considered an adequate resection by current standards. So the authors have questioned whether current surgical resection is enough given these stats. However, they haven't really proposed an alternative measure. And in terms of screening, given the recurrence rate and morbidity and mortality of vulva SEC, Perhaps regular screening of the population at risk may help. If we can find them when they're at the precursor stages, we could possibly curb progression into full-blown SEC. Thank you. Thank you, Amitha. Such a sophisticated presentation from a second year registrar. I'm really impressed. Well done. Um, We'll move on now uh, to Roy for our third presentation. Roy, would you like to unmute yourself and start sharing your screen? I'll stop sharing mine. Thanks, Roy, that's great. So, good day, I am Dr. Roy Fontillas, a resident from the University of Santa Thomas Hospital, and I will be presenting uh, this paper, a lengthy title previously mentioned by Dr. Talia. And I will start with a short introduction about vulvar squamous cell carcinoma and its precursor lesions. So a large number of vulvar carcinomas are categorized as squamous cell carcinoma, and it arises from two known pathways, the HPV-dependent and the HPV-independent pathway. So high-grade squamous cell carcinoma lesion, previously termed as usual type VIN, is the precursor lesion of the HPV-dependent VSCC. And HCL or UVIN are usually identified by the presence of nuclear hyperchromasia, loss of maturation, high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio, and striking cytological atypia present in the upper two-thirds or the entire epithelium. It has two morphologic patterns, the basaloid type, characterized by undifferentiated uh, cells with scan cytoplasm, and the warty type characterized by epithelial thickening with papillomatosis showing coilocyte changes and multinucleation. While the other is the HPV-independent BSCC, and its precursor is the differentiated uh, VIN or DVIN, and it arises from a background of chronic inflammatory lesions, most notably lichen sclerosis and can be dif very difficult to distinguish from other conditions. As for DIVIN, it is characterized by epidermal hyperplasia with parakeratosis and elongation of the retoriges and significant uh, basal cytologic atypia and cells with abundant glass eosinophilic cytoplasm. Efforts should be made to distinguish the two because based on majority of research, HPV-independent lesions have a poor prognosis associated with accelerated accelerated rate of progression and higher rates of recurrence. But some lesion may exhibit overlapping morphologic features of the two, and it may be difficult to differentiate. This is where IHCs can be utilized, and several studies have recommended the use of P16 and P53 immunostains for subclassification of VIN, especially in cases wherein morphologic distinction is difficult. Block positivity for P16 supports HCL, while well, moderate to strong basal and parabasal P53 staining supports DIVIN. However, recent studies reported cases exhibiting HPV-related uh, VIN with morphologic features suggestive of DIVIN, and these lesions have aberrant P53 expression in the mid-epithelial layer, sparing the basal layer. And these cases have been the focus of this journal, wherein the researchers retrospectively cohort and report cases exhibiting HPV-related VIN with morphologic features suggestive of DVIN and or with adjacent lichen sclerosis and correlate with immunostains P16 and P53 and utilize HPV-ish if needed and confirm with HPV-PCR. For the methodology, surges were made from the surgical pathology databases of the University of Michigan and Virginia Commonwealth University to identify vulvar specimens with IHCs for both P53 and P16, P53 alone, and those reported with overlapping morphologic features of HCL and DVIN or lichen sclerosis. It is good to note that 
All cases were reviewed and reinterpreted by a subspecialty trained gynecologic pathologist and a gynecologic path uh, pathology resident. Then electric medical records were also reviewed with the following data gathered. The cases were then subjected to immunostains P16 and P53, and in cytohybridization for high-risk HPV was performed for 19 samples, and the method detects and identifies the following HPV subtypes. HPV multiplex uh, polymerase chain reaction mass array with reflex to L1 consensus PCR was performed on 20 blo 29 blocks to confirm. Time-specific multiplex competitive PCR was performed to am amplify the E6 region. Consensus PCR targeting the L1 region of the HPV viral genome was performed on DNA samples for invalid results. The PCR products from PCR-positive samples were sequenced using the Sanger method to detect and identify the HPV types. For the results, a total of 38 specimens from 27 unique patients biopsied and a research uh, resected between 1991 and 2019 were included in the studies. Clinical data are available for all the patients and the average age is 61 years. 11 had history of HPV-related neoplasia and 16 or 76% had recurrent or persistent disease and half of them eventually achieving disease-free state. Only one progressed to invasive carcinoma, which is eight years after the initial diagnosis of HCL. And it is good to note that six of these have concurrent invasive carcinoma upon diagnosis. This next table shows the results of the morphologic features of vulvar biopsies included in the study. The histology of the 38 specimens from 27 patients resemble DIVIN or LS morphologically. 50% demonstrate areas of full thickness atypia and mitosis in the mid to upper epithelium, which are characteristic more on the H cell or usual type VIN. And it is notable that 29 of these specimens has basal atypia with 50% showing severe atypia, morphologically mimicking the VIN. And another notable finding is the presence of lichen sclerosis in 13 or 50% of the cases. At the top portion of the table, we can see that hyperkeratosis, parakeratosis, hypergranulosis, and acanthosis are also present in more than half of the biopsies. This table showed the results of the ancillary studies performed on the specimens. Majority had the original diagnosis of H cell, and some had overlapping DVIN in the diagnosis. But two were incorrectly diagnosed as DVIN as it is block positive for P16 and positive for H. PVH and high risk HPV PCR. All cases are block positive for P16, and also all exhibit the characteristic pattern of aberrant mid epithelial expression of P53 with basal layer sparing. In cases wherein HPVH was performed, most showed at least focal positivity confined at the base, and majority are positive for high HPV16 but also detected are other HPV subtypes such as HPV31, HPV52, and HPV58. In relation to the presented results, the next few slides will show pictures presented in the study, which are a clinical presentation of two patients with features of long-standing lichen sclerosis and biopsies demonstrating h cell. This is a photograph of a patient included in the study, a 57-year-old woman with a long-standing uh, lichen sclerosis and loss of labia minora. Two biopsies were taken, which are five years apart, are presented in the next slides. The representative vulvar biopsy showed H cell, features of H cell mimicking DVIN, and we can observe severe basal cytologic atypia with more of the maturation in the upper layers. The basal cells exhibit enlarged nuclei with more eosinophilic cytoplasm, and hyperkeratosis is also noted. Immunohistochemical stains are demonstrated block positivity for P16, the mid epithelial staining for P53 with basal layer sparing, and HPV ish is positive. The second biopsy, which was taken five years after, uh, again showed the morphologic features similar to the previous biopsy, and it is again positive for P16 with the uh, characteristic P53 staining and uh, HPV ish positive. Presented is another case included in the study. The photograph showed a pinned out anterior vulvectomy specimen of a 98-year-old 
female with long-standing lichen sclerosis, and multifocal leukoplakia was observed. Vulvar resection from the patient demonstrated invasive squamous cell carcinoma arising from each cell mimicking divin. With these low power histologic sections, we can see that the lesion demonstrates divin like morphology on the left, just opposed to a classic H cell or uvin morphology on the right. The classic H cell on the right shows loss of maturation of the cells and exhibiting full thickness cytologic and architectural atypia. And likewise, seen are the smaller hyperchromatic cells. As compared to the left, it has a more pronounced basal cytologic atypia, showing a glassy pink appearance. And the cells are exhibiting more maturation in the upper layer and hyperkeratosis is also noted. On immunostains, a divin-like area demonstrated uh, diffuse block positivity for P16, the aberrant mid-epithelial overexpression of P53, and mostly basal positivity for HPV-ish. The classic H cell, on the other hand, demonstrated diffuse block positivity for P16, uh, non-aberrant P53, and uh, staining and more diffuse positivity for HPV-ish. As we can see in this patient, some cases of usual vein may exhibit overlapping morphologic features and can be difficult to distinguish, especially on small biopsy specimens. So how do these results fit into the historical context? The overlapping morphologic features, P16 positivity and P53 aberrant overexpression coincides with literatures uh, mentioned in the study. And these studies focus on h cell with divin-like features and correlate it with IHCs P16 and P53. Two other studies emphasize that in these cases, a characteristic pattern of P53 expression with basal sparing is observed, and all the presented studies correlate and are similar with the results of Greisinger et al. in their study. To date, the study of Greisinger et al. is the largest cohort of these cases reported, and though these findings are relatively new, these cases may and few. The findings should be part of the consideration when signing out vulvar lesions as it affects prognosis in patients. There were unexpected findings in the study and the researchers were able to explain these findings. One unexpected finding to take note is the presence of the seven cases, which are P16 uh, and HPV-ish positive, but are negative in HPV-PCR. They explained that based on most literatures, the presence of HPV DNA does not necessarily indicate a causal relationship and could be coincidental. These cases may also be false negatives and HP evidence of HPV transformation is needed and can be proved by HPV RNA-ish or detection of HPV mRNA by molecular methods. They also explain the possibility of true negative results, but in the setting of uh, the hit and run oncogenesis theory. Uh, infections of HPV in the cutaneous epithelium may start in the oncogenic process, but the HPV virus eventually is no longer detected in the carcinoma cells when the mutations uh, are already uh, leading to uh, car carcinoma. The study is of great value in clinical applications, and it is one of the strengths of the study because of its impact on the prognosis of the patient. They also emphasize the morphologic challenge for pathologists in identifying and assessing the two pre-malignant lesions and they highlighted the role of pathologists to differentiate the two veins as it would matter in the prognosis of the patient. They also suggested the utilization of adjunctive testing with IHCs P16, P53, and HPV RNA-ish if needed. Limitations of the study were openly discussed by the researchers and can be perceived as areas of improvements. Most often, the cases are identified due to multiple stains, and some are seen adjacent to vulvar squamous cell carcinoma. And the academic institutions included in the study serves as referral centers, and they may have seen more of the advances. So my thoughts on this study is that it can be improved by increasing the number of the reviewer pathologists and to include non-referral center cases as it is possible that in non-referral hospitals, P16 and P53 are not requested more often and difficulties in morpholo morphologies are likely to be experienced. Can we implement these findings in our local practice? So though vulvar lesions are infrequently seen here uh, in the Philippines, uh, yes, the study educated us on the possible morphologic challenges of pre-malignant vulvar lesions. And this study should be, these cases should be considered during diagnosis and sign-outs of vulvar cases. 
emphasizing the difference in the prognosis of the two puts more weight on the importance of distinguishing it. The two immunostains, P16 and P53, are currently available in most of the institutions in Manila, and its use in differentiating the two premalignant lesions can be added to the utility, while taking note of some aberrant characteristic patterns in difficult cases. However, this is not the case for institutions outside of Manila. Some do not have IHCs for P16 and P53, and uh, others that have uh, immunostains, they do not have these two included in their list. Also, it is not routine to request for IHCs on vulvar lesions in the local setting, as most are already advanced in the disease upon diagnosis. And some patients, though may benefit from this, may not be able to have access to these stains. And lastly, HPV and HPV PCR may not be readily available in most, most institutions and may not be accessible for all patients. Are they a building block to something else? So definitely, yes. The study further supported the reports of previous researchers, and these findings may pave way to other scientific studies included in the, including prognostic difference of such lesions, as well as if there are possible differences in the treatment response. So this is my last slide, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Roy. That was fantastic. Um, if everyone would like to share their, uh, or stop, sorry, start to show their videos and unmute themselves, we'll have some general discussion now. Again, as per um, our last meeting, we don't look to have any questions posted by the audience, which means you must have answered all of the burning questions <laughs> <laughs> from, from the listeners. Um, I've got some questions for you, and um, I guess we'll perhaps we can go in order of, of, of presenting and maybe Roger, if, if I can start with the neuroendocrine tumours um, paper. Um, I guess my first question is, have you actually seen one of these tumours in practice? Because I haven't seen one in the vulva personally. I've seen them in the cervix, um, but, but not in the vulva. Have you encountered such a case? Um, I haven't encountered a case. I haven't reported those cases myself in the lab. But I came across uh, as our lab is one of the lo uh, is a very one of the largest lab in New, New, South, New South Wales and potentially Australia. We receive many rare cases, and we have a separate Ghani team as well. So I recently heard there was a recent case where the the neuroendocrine tumor of the bulb was detected in a pap smear, which at the pap smear was called small cell cast carcinoma, and I think that case turned out to be a neuroendocrine tumor of the vulva. So I think we do, it's not an everyday case, but I think our labs do receive those cases. That's pretty impressive picking that up on pap smear. Terrifying. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. So what do you think was the main takeaway from this paper? How, how do you think it's going to inform our practice? Did, did you um, sort of take anything away from this that you're going to put into to your daily reporting practice because I think I did I think my thing was um, think about it think about a neuroendocrine tumor because I think particularly with the large cell neuroendocrine carcinomas if you don't actually have the thought the the bubble you know the little um, light bulb rather go off in your mind it, it might just slip through mm -hmm. um, and you know it just gets lumped as a poorly differentiated squamous cell carcinoma mm -hmm. what do you think Roger do you agree with that so I guess, yeah, for me as well, the last point from the paper discussing about potential pitfalls of missing the neuroendocrine, neuroendocrine component in the vulva was the probably the most practical aspect that I gained out of this paper. And yeah, yeah. so I think these um, ancillary studies like polymer virus, antigen, and HPV RNA-ish, I think some of them are available in some of the Australian labs. So I guess perhaps when they become widely available, it is something we could include to help us distinguish between medical cell carcinoma and those which are non non medical cell, small cell, you know, endocrine tumors. Yeah, I agree with you. Neither of those ancillary studies are available um, where I practice, and I don't know anyone who's got that merkel cell um, antigen, and no one doing HPV ish. So I guess for us, we need to think about doing a CK twenty CAM five point two. Um, and just having having it on our radar, I suppose, um, as I think we probably do 
to a certain extent in the cervix because we know a component of neuroendocrine carcinoma happens um, more commonly. Um, but to also now think about that in the in the cutaneous side as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if those Merkel cells are going to have targeted therapy, like yeah, they sort of absolutely. mentioned at the very end of the paper, which I, I, I think Roger, you commented on that was interesting because for me, it's always yeah. like, well, what is the impact on the patient, right? I might not have this polyoma yeah. antigen, but if I can indicate that and that's a possibility for them, then it's something we should all be, like you said, just keeping it. Absolutely. Mind. Bringing it into, into clinical relevance. Right. Yeah particularly as these are aggressive tumors. So metastatic right. disease is unfortunately um, not that uncommon. Yeah. Amitha, your, your paper, um, I thought it raised a number of interesting talking points. What, yeah. what was the main, <laughs> the main takeaway from me was um, the subtlety of DVIN and the fact that the importance of recognizing DVIN at the margins of a vulvar SCC excision specimen. And um, the author's point about the DVIN often being more subtle than it appears in the textbooks. It's such a hard diagnosis to make. And, you know, it, we, we do our P53 stains hoping that it will clarify uh, the, the diagnostic scenario for us. And often it doesn't. Mm, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so what, what, what more do we need to be doing um, to try and increase recognition of DVIN? And, and um, as the authors are hinting, do we need to do more for these patients, both surgically and also in the way we're handling these specimens with um, P53 signatures now being described? Do we need to be doing P53 on our margins <laughs> on these excision specimens and having a really low threshold for calling margin positive for DVIN? What, That's what do you so think? hard. So, like you've said, I think um, recognizing how important it is to diagnose DVIN is, is, is one of my take homes because I think out of these nine patients with recurrent tumors, five of them had DVIN at the, or a precursor lesion at the margin. I think four were DVIN and one was devil. And it was missed when they re reviewed it. So, it just shows because it doesn't present with your full textbook of features that you, well, I guess most pathology doesn't really, don't always present with the full textbook, but I think that even is notorious in that it can be incredibly subtle. So I guess having that low threshold and understanding the different kind of staining patterns of Deven, I think they've mentioned all these different new staining patterns with um, basal overexpression and um, the null expression. And I think that's something to also just be aware of. Um, in terms of other things we could be doing, there is this paper that came out of Germany a few years ago where they did a resection, um, bulbal resection based on, they call these ontogenetic cancer fields. So they proposed that the way bulbal carcinoma spread was along embryonic lines. So instead of doing these standard wide local excisions, they did a new type of bulbal field resection based on these developmental tissue planes. And they found on that, that the survival was actually improved compared to standard wide local. So maybe that's something to look at for future modalities. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I get the sense that the pendulum's starting to swing back now and we're wondering about questioning the wisdom of the move to more conservative local excision and the move away from radical bulbectomy for the particularly the HPV independent of our SCCs and whether um, maybe that's what the authors are hinting at that we need to start to move back to a more radical um, excision yeah. um, in order to try and um, reduce the mortality. Although the question the obvious question is what's the morbidity of these large yeah. procedures and whether that the, the equation oh, and I, balance is that. Yeah, and uh, Karen, I don't know if you have this experience or any of the trainees, but when you call a surgeon sometimes just because sometimes you know if something comes up and you just want to say, I just want to run this by you and make sure I was orienting the specimen correctly or what have you. And you'll say, well, it looks like your lateral was positive. And they're like, oh yeah, I can't take any more. I won't be able to <laughs> yeah. put it back together. You know, so I understand the point they were making in this paper. And obviously the authors of this paper are well-known experts on vulvar pathology, but I just sometimes I wonder if the margins were always going to be positive for Devon, you know, because if you're like, 
it's kind of like when they're trying to resect pageants or something, sometimes they just can't get it all out, you know? And so they're just kind of doing the best they can. And sometimes these patients are older as well, right? And so they might not want really aggressive treatment, but wouldn't it be nice if they could yeah, get no, around I, it? I, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I think that also colors our mindset a bit when we're reporting on the margins. Mm -hmm. You know, we know if we report deep in at the margins, it, it, it's, I guess it's asking the surgeon to go, to go back and take more tissue when, when that may not be possible. Right. Um, and yeah, we, we're very, um, we're conditioned to try and be conservative, I think. Um, right. And maybe, yeah, rightly or wrongly, maybe that's not the best thing ultimately for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there are limits, aren't there, to what is surgically resectable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another point I thought was interesting was um, the point that to increase the recognition of DVIN, maybe um, taking a biopsy from the site where the interface between the lesion and the normal skin is, is represented might increase the, the yield for diagnosis of DVIN. And I, I don't know that I get that in my, my vulval punch biopsies. Typically, it's just lesional tissue. So that might be something interesting to raise with our clinicians. Um, a different context doing diagnostic biopsy as opposed to resection. Yes. Yeah, you were talking about P53, Karen. I find the biopsies are the hardest times to interpret those because they're often um, mal-oriented, to put it kindly. And it would be nice um, to interpret it in the context of what's going on in the background skin. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. My screen's frozen, but I can still hear everyone. So I'm assuming we everyone can still else... hear you. So it's like a video. Okay. Just keep going. Okay. We're doing good. Okay. <laughs> um, Roy, I've got a couple of questions for you if you're if you're able. Um, the first first point for me um, in in that paper is, and you obviously talked about this, is how we really need to um, keep our minds open when we're dealing with a typical squamous epithelium and a vulvar biopsy, um, although it may hit you as DVIN, it could well be HCIL. And, and the application of P53 and P16 stains is probably something we should do routinely in this context. Um, it's certainly something I've put into practice over the last couple of years. Um, and I gather you don't see these sorts of biopsies that often in the Philippines, yes, yes. but... Um, yeah, going forward, do you think you will change your practice in that context, in the rare instances that that, that occurs? <laughs> well, I think uh, here we really rely on heavily on morphologic features. And then, well, based on this paper, there can be mimics, there can be overlapping features. So I think uh, very good communication with uh, other pathologists or like, uh, specialty trained pathologists, if this uh, stains are needed, can be very helpful. And I guess, again, uh, communication with the clinicians is because uh, some of the patients here are not, uh, like they want to manage the patients more like uh, drastic. They don't, they have, uh, like they have the uh, authority to be managed more aggressively so sometimes uh, it can be these things can be an apparent bypass on uh, by small biopsies yeah although I have to say that that image you showed the first figure from yes. the paper <laughs> that <laughs> that was ultimately block p16 positive um, I, I'd struggle to even call that low-grade squamous dysplasia um, so morphology obviously has its limits in yes. this context. Yeah, and actually that was another question that um, popped into my mind when I was reading the paper is, um, yes, it's P16 block positive, but why is it HCIL? Why could it not be an LCIL lesion that's got integrated high-risk HPV? Mm. Well, I think for one, LCILs are rare. <laughs> and then, well, if... Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, based on my readings, LCs are, they have this patchy or like focal positivity for P16 and like uh, HCLs wherein uh, they have this block positivity for P16. And then uh, on morphology, it is really hard to 
differentiate the upper layers are very uh, well differentiated on the first picture. So. Yeah, look, I, I think it's recognised that a proportion of L cells are caused by integrated high risk HPV, so can have a block type pattern of staining with P16, as in the cervix. Um, it's, and the difficulty in the vulva is that we have this modifying stimulus of chronic inflammation and irritation mm -hmm. causing a maturation phenomenon and altering the morphology. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's difficult. Um, and personally, and I, I'm going to keep yeah. doing the stains. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's like the, amount, the number of papers that have been written about P16 positivity yes, yeah. and the number of really respected people who can't agree on the questions that we're asking right now is <laughs> profound. So I think when you do have black P16 positivity, you have to take it seriously, right? You have to mm -hmm. figure out what's going on. But I think, Karen, you're, it's a, I don't even know if it's answerable, the question. <laughs> yeah. It's a smart yep. question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We've gone um, over the hour, so shall we shall we wrap up? I've, I've got tons more questions, but we probably need to draw a line under it. Um, thank you to all of our presenters today for being so willing to take on these these weighty uh, papers and and present them and for doing such a fine job and distilling the information down. Um, thank you, Natalie, for being here, and thank you to our audience. We've gotten some wonderful comments. Um, it sounds like everyone's um, enjoyed themselves. So thank you. Um, thanks for joining. And if you see can fill out the uh, evaluation on yeah. your way out to all the people watching, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.